Son of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Well, first of all, a very good evening to all of you. Tonight, as we started uh, last Friday, uh, we started looking at the miracles in the Gospel of St. John, miracles of the Gospel of St. John, and we said that there, were se there are seven miracles in the Gospel of St. John. And uh, the first one we looked at was the wedding of Cana, and uh, we talked in details about the wedding of Cana, and we said that it was talking about the Holy Baptism, which is one of the seven sacraments of the true Church of Jesus Christ. And um, we talked about that each miracle takes three chapters. The first chapter is an introduction to the miracle. The second is the actual miracle. And the third one is the result or the outcome of that miracle. And uh, we said that uh, the um, John the Beloved used instead of the word miracle, he used the word sign, because he says uh, at the wedding of Cana, when he talks about it in, in chapter two, he says this was the first sign that Jesus did when he started his ministry, and we talked how a sign is different to a miracle, and it is because talking about a dogma, it's trying to teach us something that is sacramental in the church. So the wedding of Cana, we said that it was to do with the holy baptism, i.e. uniting heaven and earth, God and humanity one more time after the fall of Adam and all his descendants. How did, it, how did unity come back? The ladder, which Jacob saw in Genesis 28 too, where he saw this letter with the angels going up and down on, the, on that letter. And that letter was connecting heaven and earth. And then in the Gospel of John chapter 1, the end of it, the Lord Jesus is saying exactly the same thing to Nathanael, which happened to be later on one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Nathanael or Bartholomew, the son of Tholomew. So he said to Nathanael, what are you going to say, Nathanael, when you see heaven opened and the angels of heaven going up and down on the Son of Man? And Jacob sees angels going up and down on the ladder, on the ladder which connected heaven and earth. So who is the true ladder that connected heaven and earth, i.e. God and humanity, is Jesus of Nazareth? How did he connect, unite, reunite God with humanity? The wedding of Cana. What happened there? Wine. Water was changed into wine by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that was representing his blood. His blood that is going to be shed on Calvary three years and a bit later on. So by the shedding of his blood, the true ladder united God with humanity because he paid the price of our errors through the shedding of his blood. The result of that was talking to Nicodemus, chapter 3. He says, unless you are born of water and spirit, you cannot, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What is being born of water and spirit? The holy baptism. So what is the wedding of Cana? The first three chapters talking about 
the sacrament of the holy baptism. Through baptism, we are reunited with God and being adopted by Jesus Christ to God the Father as children and heirs to the throne. Now tonight, we're going to talk about the second miracle. And the second miracle is healing the royal official's son. Here we go. And it's from John chapter 4, verses 46 to 54. We're going to read. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed, and please pay attention to the word believed. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. And glory be to our Lord Jesus forever and ever. If you want to give it a title, these verses from 46 to 54, which is the end of chapter 4, we will give it believing in the Word. He believed the Word. If you want to give it a title, Believing in the Word. To understand this miracle or this sign, we need to see what happened just prior to that. Just prior to that. What happened prior to that? The Lord Jesus leaves Judea and Jerusalem and heads to Galilee. He leaves the south of Israel and goes to the north of Israel. Why? Because Jesus said, a prophet is without dignity only in his, in his own household. Has no dignity in, in his own household. What is this trying to tell us? Why did he leave Judea or the south of Israel, Jerusalem, the best part of Israel, the top classy people of Israel, and he goes to Galilee, the second class citizen, as it was seen to the eyes of the Pharisees, the scribes, and the, and the priests? He said, because a prophet is without dignity in his own household, in his own family. Why do we, why are we without dignity within our own family? You know, I say something to a family member, they won't respect it. Yet I say the same thing to a stranger, and they respect it totally. And then I feel I don't have respect at home. Nobody respects me, nobody shows that I have my own respect and dignity at home. Why are you ignorant to me? Well, to put it simply, because they are used to me all the time. They have seen me growing up since childhood, and they have seen me every day, almost, if I say, unless you go clubbing and come back two days later, I'm not sure. But they have seen me day in, day out, in and out. I'm in their face all the time. After so many years, they are so used to me, they will just totally ignore me. And my words, all of a sudden now, are of no effect or of very little effect. But to someone, a stranger, 
They don't know who I am. They have no idea what my background is. When I say something, they might say, whoa, this guy knows what he's talking about. But my family says, ah, oh, shut up. Yeah, 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 blah, 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 whatever. And we get that from the people around us. However, however, there is a much deeper meaning here when Jesus, our Lord and Savior, said, a prophet is with no dignity in his own family. There is a deeper meaning here. We need to go more into it. And what is that deeper meaning of it? Is that when I see myself within me without dignity, just like I live in the middle of a family, I live within myself. This is the town. This is the place, the dwelling place that I live in. And when I look at myself and see all the errors, mistakes, wrong things that I've done, I see myself so low. And I despise myself. And did you know, one of the biggest obstacles for people to come close to Christ is when they see themselves within themselves without dignity. I ask someone, I say, please come, I want to see you at church this Sunday. You know what, Father, I'm not ready. You know why? I don't want to come to church. You know why, Father? Because I'm afraid that I'll come to church, I'll listen to the liturgy, I'll listen to the Holy Gospel being read, I'll come and receive the Holy Communion, and I'll go and sin again. Then when I look at myself, I see myself so low, so cheap, and I'm just deceiving Jesus, and I'm just playing with Jesus, precious blood and body, so therefore, I don't see I have dignity for myself. I'm not worthy to come. So you know what? Jesus can do without me. I think it's better. It is the biggest obstacle for people to have a second thought and walk away from Jesus because they see themselves very low. But guess what? Don't ever, don't ever, and I'll emphasize on it again, don't ever let the devil play with your head and say, you are cheap, you are nothing, you're not worthy. Don't go and waste Jesus' time and your time because you know what? You're going to receive him and you're going to let him down again. Don't do it. Don't listen to those kind of ideas. And if you see yourself with that dignity, well, that's you. Jesus does not see you the same way you see yourself because Jesus is mighty, he's God. What you cannot do, he can. What you cannot change, he can. What you cannot fulfill, he can. And it's not your work, it's his work. It is not your responsibility, it's his. But your responsibility is to come. Your responsibility is not to fix yourself, it's just to turn to him and run to him. Fixing is Christ's responsibility, not yours. And another thing, the church and the Holy Bible is represented as hospital. And Jesus said it. He said, I came for the sick. I am the doctor that heals freely. I came for those who put their hands up and say, I'm sick. If you are not sick, I didn't come for you. I'm sorry. I can't do nothing. So if you think, and if you believe, and if you see that you are sick spiritually, sick mentally, sick physically, speak, sick you name it, this is the place for you. The church is the place for you. It is the place for those who see themselves without dignity. And the Holy Eucharist is the medicine for those who say, Jesus, I am sick. Then Jesus will turn and say, this is my body, this is my blood. Take this medicine for your sickness and for your illness. And that is why the Lord Jesus left Jerusalem. The high class people who thought of themselves too much, who thought of themselves that they are the worshipers of God, 
They are the teachers of the law. They are the people who show the way for others to come to God. When Jesus saw that, he said, I can't stay in a place where people have this kind of dignity. If you think of yourself too much, if you think you are better than the others, if you think you are stronger, you're smarter, and you are letting other people down, Jesus will walk away from you. Be careful. So where did Jesus go when he left the high class people, the educated? He went to Galilee. We talked about Galilee last time, remember? What did he say? Galilee is a Hebrew, Aramaic, or Syriac word, Gigla. Galila, Gigla. Gigla means circle. And the Holy Bible, when it talks about Galilee, calls it Galilee of the nations. Jalil al umam the nations of Galilee. Why? Because in 1 Kings chapter 17, 24, in 1 Kings chapter 17, 24, you read about Galilee. What happened in Galilee? There was different nationalities that were brought during the rule of the uh, Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was in charge. He ruled over that part of the world. And other parts of the world. So he took some of the Israelites people to Babylon, Iraq, and he brought five different nationalities into Galilee. And those nationalities that came into Galilee, we read it in 1 Kings 17, they brought their own gods and their own worship and, and ritual rites into that place. It's not our topic, I think, but I have to say this. It's not our topic, but I'll have to say this. They brought five different worships, five different gods. And there were still Jewish people, Israelite people still in Galilee. So what happened to those Israelite people? They mixed with the rest of those people that came from Iraq and different parts of the Babylonian Empire. So they started learning different worships to false gods. Yet these Israelites only had one true living God and they worshipped him but they were influenced by all these other nations. So they started worshiping other gods. So that's why the priests, the Jewish priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees are Jerusalem, high-class people. They see themselves that we are the true worshipers of the true divine God. The Jewish in Galilee are a reject because they have mixed with other nations and they now are spoiled they're no good that's why when the Lord met the Samaritan woman remember the story he met this woman she was a naughty woman she had five boyfriends huh? she had five husbands sorry and the one the sixth one was her boyfriend the Lord started talking to this woman it's not our topic I haven't it's an introduction when the Lord started talking to this woman he said to her, go and call your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, true, because you had five and you swiped them under the carpet, brother. And the one with you, the sixth one, is your boyfriend, is not your husband. She said, how? Oh, how did you know all this? Our father said when the Messiah comes, he's going to tell us everything. Looks like you are the Messiah. So who were the five husbands? And the one with her was the boyfriend, not the husband. Are the five gods that were brought into Galilee by the different nations. And who is the sixth one who is a boyfriend now, not the true husband? The law of Moses, the true Torah of God. Because they one day worshipped the Torah or followed the Torah and the other followed the other five gods. So she had five husbands. And the true husband who is the law now is her boyfriend because she is not following the law. But she can't. Guess what? Because the seventh one is the true husband who came and was betrothed to her at the well. What is the well? The baptismal font. 
at the baptismal font, he was betrothed. He said, I am the true husband that you should be united to and linked to. Because the five are false gods. The six is the law. You cannot fulfill the law. I will fulfill the law on your behalf. Because no one can do everything God says except Jesus of Nazareth. So he went to Galilee, the reject people, the people who have been influenced by false gods. Because he said, I came for those who say, I have no dignity. I came for those who feel are refused and rejected by society who feel and see themselves, I'm good for nothing. I came specifically for you. So don't lose hope. Be courageous. No matter how weak and miserable and hopeless and lost you are, Jesus came for the lost. So the miracle starts. A prophet is without dignity in his own town, in my own heart in my own mind, in my own self. This is the town. So what is the miracle about? Believing on the Word. Believing on the Word. Jesus came to Cana of Galilee again. And it says, a noble man, a certain noble man, his son was sick at Capernaum. This noble man, talks about he was a servant in the king's palace. This nobleman was a servant in the king's palace. This nobleman's son was sick. So he heard about Jesus that he left Judea and Jerusalem and came to Galilee. So he came running to Jesus Christ first time. He only heard about Jesus. He hasn't seen him yet. He only heard some gossip and rumors about Christ that we've got a great healer in, in, in the midst of us. So he said, you know what? I'm going to go and ask him to come down and heal my son. This guy is a servant in the king's palace. And here, the English translation talks about a noble man. The actual translation was a servant in the king's palace. His son was sick, this servant. Now, why is he saying to us what his profession was? A servant in the king's palace. Why is he mentioning the profession? He's trying to tell us something. <coughs> we get influenced by the people we hang around with. We are influenced by the people we are associated with. This guy worked in the king's palace. And a nobleman means he would do and believe in everything his king would ask or say. So if his king one day would come and say, I'm going to chop your head, he took it literally that his head is going to be chopped because the king spoke and the king is not going to go back on his word. So this guy is actually working in the king's palace. He is associated with the king, so he is getting the habits of the king. And the king sticks by his word. A king can't go back on his word because it is very uh, degrading for the king and very shameful for a king to say something and not deliver it. It's very embarrassing. So that's why this guy learned all these years that whatever my king says is 100%, I'm not going to even question it. I'm not going to doubt it because the king's word is everything. And it's 100% guaranteed. So in that state of mind, you associate yourself with doctors, you're going to be a doctor. And if even you're not going to be a doctor, but you're going to be talking like a doctor. Whoever you are associated with, you're going to imitate and copy sooner or later. You associate with someone that swears, before you know it, you will swear as well and you'll become a master of uh, swear school. <laughs> you'll, you'll be graduating generations, teaching them how to swear. 
eloquently and beautifully. I kill you. You associate yourself with Marmari, you're going to look beautiful. <laughs> Whoever you're going to associate yourself with, that's what you're going to learn and do. This guy came with a state of mind already locked in that I'm going to meet the king of the Jews because I heard there is someone called Jesus of Nazareth. He is being called the king of the Jews. I've been working all these years with my king. I know when my king says something, that's it. It's finale, finished. It's a deal done, stamp, seal, finito. No argument. I trust when my king says something. So he came with that state of mind that I'm coming to meet the king of the Jews. He did not know that he came to see not only the king, but the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. But his belief, that little belief, he said, I'm going to accept everything he says. So he came first time meeting Jesus. Jesus, my son is sick. Please come down and heal my son. And he uses the word come down. Well, in order to, for us to be healed, Jesus had to come down from heaven to earth to heal us all. Didn't he? He left his glorious throne and he came and dressed up in the flesh. He came down to our world in order for us to be healed from our illness. Jesus come down because my son is sick. And where was this sick man? In Capernaum. Capernaum, my beloved, is about seven miles uh, from Jerusalem. And it used to be the place where the kings of Israel would have their retreat palaces there. So being a, a, a king of Israel, a very busy kind of job, always on the go, on the run. So they needed to have a break. So when they needed that break, they would go into their palace that was built in Capernaum to have some rest and recharge the battery, as they say. The word Capernaum, again, it's Hebrew, Aramaic, or Syri Syriac, means Kapar, means city. Nahom, Kapar Nahom, Nahom means rest. So Capernaum, the city of rest. The city of rest. So where was this guy sick, being tormented? In Capernaum. And this noble man went to Jesus and said, Please, Jesus, come down to Capernaum and put my son at rest. And Jesus said to this guy, Jesus said to this guy, Go. I'm not going to perform the miracle. Jesus didn't go. He said, go, your son is alive. There's nothing wrong with your son. Look at this. The man believed on the word because he is dealing with the king. And he's been dealing all these years with the king. He knows when a king says something, it's done deal. So when Jesus, the king of the Jews and the king of all kings, when he said, go, I'm not going to come. You're asking me to come down to Capernaum and heal your son. I'm not coming. I'm not going. I'm just saying to you, go in peace. Your son is healed. He is alive. He is whole. The man believed on the word of Jesus Christ as the king. But what did Jesus say beforehand? Look at this. He said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. See, the Lord does not want you to see than to believe. He wants you to believe in order to see. He said, come down, please. I want to see you healing him in front of my eyes. He said, go, 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 go. I'm not coming. Your son is healed. Can you believe in that? He said, the man believed on the word. 
Because Jesus does not like it when we say, I want to see a sign. Jesus, show me a sign so I can believe that you're with me. Jesus, show me. Maybe some lightning come down and strike me or an angel show up in my room or you come and slap me and say, I'm with you. Get along with it. Please, unless you come, a dream or something, I'm begging you. Like you, you're begging Jesus, yet he is in you and all of you. He is all you. And you're looking for him? My goodness. So he said, you're not going to believe unless you see a sign. I don't like that. Seeing a sign is for little bambinos. I've got to show you a picture in order for you to absorb it and comprehend what I'm saying. But now you're maturing grown-ups. Act like one. Believe without seeing. I want you to go beyond what your naked eye can tell you and deceive you. I'll give you an example in the Old Testament, Elijah. Elijah the prophet, the fiery, the feast, the, you know, the strong, lion-hearted uh, Elijah and that feared no one. One day he came to God and he said, you know, what's going on? We are getting in trouble and there is famine everywhere and we are in deep trouble. He said, you know what? I'm going to show you, Elijah, on how to believe on the word. I don't want you to see in order for you to believe. I want to make you strong, Elijah. Elijah, go to, um, to this city in Israel and you're going to meet this widow. This widow had the only son. Her husband had passed away and she's got only one son with her. That's it. And she's a widow and there was only a handful of flour to make some bread for only to be enough for that day only to feed her son who is starving and maybe herself if lucky enough and the next day they would die from hunger starvation so the Lord God sent Elijah toward this widow woman to show Elijah that this woman has stronger faith than you he came and he said peace to this house he said peace to you too he said, do you have any food to eat? She said, I only have a handful that is going to be enough for my son and myself only for today and tomorrow. More than likely, we're going to die. He said, I am a prophet of God. She said, it's a great blessing to be talking to a prophet of God. Welcome. He said, she started baking it. And then Elijah said, I want to eat this bread. She said, I will give it to you with pleasure. You know what? If I ate the bread, listen to the faith of this woman. If I ate this bread and then tomorrow died, what would I have achieved? Nothing. But at least let me feed the prophet of God and die. At least I'll receive a blessing from God that I have fed his own prophet. She gave the only bread that their life depends on, their, on that bread that day to this strange man called Elijah, the prophet of God. She gave it. She said, you eat it. Elijah became fiery. He said, my goodness, she made me feel so little and embarrassed. He got up. He said, the true living God in the name of the true living God of Israel Bread will never cease from this house for the rest of your lives. Will never cease. You will have food all the days of your life. Because what you did was believing on the word. Believing on the word. The Lord Jesus rose from the dead from the New Testament. And he is standing at the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And the, his disciples Simon Peter and all the good boys there in that little boat they've been fishing all night long they caught absolutely nothing in the early morning Jesus is the shores he said hey little boys I got any fish he said absolutely nothing Jesus said throw the net on the right hand side of the boat and you're gonna catch a lot of fish and this is where the last miracle about in the Gospel of John anyway 
Now, Simon Peter is a professional, professional expert fisherman. He knows very well. Now, Jesus, as a profession, was a carpenter. <laughs> he was the son of a carpenter, they called him. So by profession, he's a carpenter. Carpenters are not too good with fishing. So they were in the deep. The fisherman, the expert, Simon Peter, he knows that I can't catch fish in the deep. I've got to come to the shores to catch fish. Because fish come searching for the food in the shallow waters, not in the deep. But he said, well, on your word, Jesus, I will throw the net in the deep. I know logically it's impossible. Being an expert in fishing, it is impossible. Everybody's going to make fun of me and is going to laugh at me. But because you said it, I believe on your word, I'm going to throw it in the deep. And when he threw it, the net was so full of fish that it was barely pulled out to the shores. Believing on the word. On the word. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, speaking of professions, in Israel, there were three different types of educations, different levels of educations. Those families who were rich, they would send their children to the army. Now, you know, till now, the Jewish people, everyone must go to the army. You leave high school, you cannot go to university unless you enter the army first for a couple of years. You serve in the army and then you continue TAFE or uni. But after high school, you're 18, you enter the army for about two years because the army gives you very good discipline, makes you a man even if you're a woman. <laughs> anyway, so the families who were rich, they, would be, uh, they were uh, able to send their children to the army because it was very expensive to send your children to the armies. The middle class people, they would t give their children the chance to have some sort of a trade, a carpenter, uh, I don't know, whatever. I don't know if there was welding at the time or panel beating, I'm not sure, but any, any trade. The, the poor, poor class citizens, they would either give their children the opportunity of becoming a shepherd or a fisherman. Galilee was well known to cater fishermen because they were of very low class citizens, very poor. That's why they were all fishermen. Jesus went there and caught 12 disciples to be the fisher of men, not fish. So anyway, believing on the word. Now, why does Jesus does not want you to make an emphasis to see a sign. You know, like you hear about a place that there is um, oil coming out of the wall or something, or a picture is talking and flipping the eyes, and you say, oh my goodness, and then you say, hallelujah, oh Jesus, I love you now, I adore you. And then when the sign is finished, so as your faith is finished. A sign is temporary. Jesus wants your faith to last. He doesn't want to be seasonal. When you see something good happening, you love Jesus. When, th when things go wrong, you say, Jesus, I don't want to talk about you anymore. That's it. I've had enough. No. Faith is steady, regardless what the condition is in the situation. Whether you are hungry or full, whether you are sick or healthy, whether you are poor or rich, whether you are strong or weak, whether you are dead or alive, your faith must stay and remain steady because this is what's going to make it happen at the end, not the miracle or that sign that Jesus shows you. That's why he doesn't want you to see a sign in order to believe. He wants you to believe on the word. Now, why? As I said, a sign is only temporary. How long is it going to last? That miracle. Mother Mary, by the way, the Queen of Heaven, appeared in 1964 in, uh, as in the Zaytun, which is a city in Cairo, in Egypt. In 1964, the Holy Mother appeared on top of the church. I actually myself visited that church uh, a few years back. For two years, there was wonders and miracles. 
13 million people of all walks of life came and witnessed the miraculous Queen of Heaven being transfigured, if I can say, because she was a 3D. They saw a lady, it was not just a shadow, it was a 3D walking on top of the dome. From our brothers Muslims, our brothers Jews, Christians, you name it, and all walks of life. Millions of people got healed. Blind people came to that site on the spot, their eyes opened, crippled, stood up, paralyzed people, step, eh, miracles, miracles, miracles. But what happened to that sign? Mother Mary just shook him a bit, but that sign is not there forever. But your faith is forever. You need to have faith. Now, I'll come to a more theological interpretation. Why believing on the word is a must, not seeing, theologically speaking. The Gospel of John that we are you know, talking about, the miracles in the Gospel of John, the very beginning of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, John the Beloved, St. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he is introducing Jesus Christ as God, the Word, the Logos in the Greek text. Logos means intellect, not a word that I'm saying to you, the brain. So literally we can say in the beginning was the brain the brain was with God and the brain was God but he's introducing Jesus Christ as the word now my question to you the first thing what do you notice about the word do you see the word or hear the word hear the word first you don't see it yeah when he believed on the word what did he believe? He heard. Jesus said, go, your son is healed. He knows he is sick. He knows he is going to die. If Jesus doesn't come, he's going to die. But when he heard the word, he believed on the word. And if you believe, you shall receive. Now, Jesus Christ is the word. If you ever try to see him first, it will never happen. Because... He came as the Word, and the Word in its all context must be heard first in order to be seen later. Because you can't see the Word straight away. You must hear it. And that's why St. Paul says that faith comes by hearing. See, St. Paul is big head in theology. Great theologian, man. He knows what he's talking about. He said, faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. Because, guys, the person who you should believe in is the Word, and the Word must be heard in order to be seen. And that is why when a child is born, do you know why they come out crying? Because the very first thing they witness is noise they can't see but they can hear a child cannot see for 40 days clearly but they can hear very clearly from the word go you came out to the world why is he crying because in his mother's womb he was living in silence in peace swimming floating he thought he's like in the universe you know somewhere no gravity, no friction, no chaos, no nothing. Everything is tranquil. Food comes, food goes. Ah, oh, beautiful. And it's very peaceful. I love it. And it's very secure. And poor mom is sweating it out. And when he comes or when she comes, when that baby comes out to this world, the first thing, the people around, you know, and they make it a big noise. This poor little baby is not used to this noise pollution, especially the Arabic, you know, speaking, oh my goodness, man. What is this alien people around me? I'm scared. So the baby hears. That's why cries, scared. So the first gift God gives you is hearing before any other sense. Before you taste, before you touch, before you see, before you smell, you hear.
and you cry. You don't say, oh, great food, Lebanese tabbouleh, Habibi, beautiful. <laughs> you hear. Because the one who created us is the Logos, is the Word. I must hear Him. Believing in the Word. When you hear, accept, you will see. This is the perfect order. Don't take it out of context. Don't take it out of order. Christ cannot be transfigured unless you hear Him, accept Him. Then He will be transfigured in, you, in your life and become tangible. It's very vital. Now, the other thing that I want to bring your attention to and I'll sum it up. Some people say, uh, you know, uh, the people that follow the logics, uh, the, the scientists, um, uh, the perfectionist people, I don't know, you name it. They say that unless I see, unless I understand, unless I can grasp it, I, will, I cannot believe it. Don't tell me believe in something I'm not seeing. I need to see, I need to know, to comprehend, to understand, then I'll think about it. Well, the word understand, and you probably heard me saying this before, well, I'll say it again. The word understand, if we have not paid enough attention to it, it's two words in one. It is under the stand. So I'm already saying to myself, and I'm confessing to myself, that I can only get what is under the stand. Anything above the stand, I cannot get. Well, guess what? God works, operates, talks above the stand always. He's always in the supernatural. We are in the natural. He is the supernatural. And science calls it miracle. Miracle, what is a miracle? It's something that is a phenomena that has no explanation. Supernatural. Christians call it Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Very simple. So God always operates in the above stand. When will you ever comprehend God? Never. If you want to use your head to understand and accept Jesus and believe in Him. I want to see because when you see, you see all the senses, they actually influence the mind. You see, you hear, you touch, you smell, you taste, influences your mind. You start thinking and you start, you know, putting it one plus one equals two. So you are using your head to prove God's existence. It won't work because he is above the stand. Your intellect with its supreme power can only comprehend what is under the stand. So, another thing, to understand something, that means you have to contain that thing in your head. When you say one plus one, when I ask you and I say one plus one equals, you say two. How did you manage to get to the result of two? Because this formula, you were able to contain it in your head. Your head was bigger than this formula. That's why you reached its Result, it's end. If you ever can contain God in your head in order to understand Him, then He is no longer God. You are God because you became bigger than Him. If you are able to put Him in your head. Because unless you put Him in your head, you won't understand Him. And if you're able to put Him in your head, then you'll understand Him, then He's no longer God. You are because you're bigger than Him because your head was bigger than Him. Your intellect was bigger than Him. That will never happen. So, the only way to understand God is to believe in the Word in order to see what God will do for you. Therefore, God is not a thought, is an experience in your life. How can I understand that God is in my life, God exists through the experiences that you have gone through in your life? How many times have I been in trouble and I knew and I realized that there was no way out of this and I saw an invisible hand pulling me out without a blemish, without a scratch. I wonder who that hand was. Was it you? No, because you said I give up. It's a dead end. 
Where was the family members? Where were your friends? All gone. Who pulled you out of that trouble? God. God is an experience. From experiences, you get to learn that God exists. This is the only way. And how do you experience God? When you believe on the word, when Jesus said, go, your son is, is alive, he is healed. When he believed on the word, he went. And when he went, what happened? He met his servants on the way. And he asked them, they said, Master, your son is alive. He asked them and said, when did my son become good? They said, yesterday on the seventh hour, he was good. Then this man believed that it was the same time when Jesus said to him, go, your son is whole, is made whole. It was the seventh hour that his, at the time when Jesus said, your son is good, exactly the same time of Jesus saying, on the spot, his son was healed. On the spot, same hour yesterday looks like it took him a day to go back home wow what a great believer this guy huh he went a day journey on foot just to say king of the jews heal my son what a great faith do we go the distance for christ or we say i live in fairfield and the church in hoxton park middleton grange you know it's going to take me with traffic half an hour to drive Man, it's too much. If it was near Fairfield, Nita City, I would have gone. Because it's within walking distance. But it's too much to go half an hour driving comfortably, air conditioned car, with the Sabuka Khabib in the back seat. <laughs> driving, huh? It's too much to drive half an hour for Jesus. Jesus came from eternities, from the <coughs> From the heavenly life to the earthly life, no distance, because it's so far away. He came just to say, I love you guys and I'm with you. Doesn't he deserve for us to go that extra mile for him? I think he does. So he said, on the seventh hour yesterday, what is the seventh hour that his son got here? The seventh hour, my beloved, represents the seventh day. What is the seventh day? The day of rest. Shabbat or Shabbat or Saturday is the seventh day of creation. Thursday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, seventh day, Saturday. Now the word Shabbat or Shabbat is a Hebrew or Syriac, means rest. God created everything in six days and He rested on the seventh day. Now the seventh day on its own needs a lecture. Saturday is rest. There are some people, they worship God on the Sabbath, on Saturday. And they say because that is the law of the Old Testament and we should keep this day because God said, the Lord God said, this is the holy day of me. You preserve it, you keep it and you come and worship me on the Sabbath, the seventh day. So as other Christians, Catholics, Orthodox, and uh, they worship Jesus Christ on Sunday. So some Christians say, but you guys, you have broken the law. You've changed the day of God from Saturday, Sabbath to Sunday. You have, tried, uh, you know, you have your heart, this is a blasphemy. You broke God's law. It's a sin. And our answer to that is, what is Sabbath? And who is Sabbath? Are the seven days of creation literal? Are we going to take them literal? No. That's one. The second thing, it's a long story. The second thing, my question is, when does really God rest? Or how does God rest? Says God rested on the seventh day. Okay, what is rest? What do you mean when I rest? Example. Let's say you go to work and you're working from 8 o'clock and you are having lunch at around 12 o'clock. So from 8 till 11.59 you work. When lunch time came 12 o'clock, you are having a break, you're having a rest, yes? But are you really having a rest? What is a rest? 
A rest is I was doing something, I stopped doing that thing, and now I started doing something else. That is rest. True enough. When you're having lunch, are you doing absolutely nothing? No. You're gonna go and wash your hands, wash your face, bring out your whatever your picnic basket, and you're gonna have your lunch. You are still working, you are not resting. So rest is I was doing one thing, I finished, and now I started doing something else. So, what does it mean when God rested on the seventh day? He finished creating the universe and the world, and He rested on the seventh day. He started looking after what He created on the seventh day. And by the way, the seventh day it's still not over. We are still living the seventh day. So therefore, the days of creation are not literal. Otherwise, we're in trouble. We're still living the seventh day. And if you read in Genesis, every day it says it was evening and morning. Thursday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Every day they say there was evening and morning. The seventh day doesn't say there was evening, there was morning. Because we are still living. When does God rest? Very short. The only time God, our Heavenly Daddy, will rest when He sees His whole children in good health, in good uh, success, in good condition, in front of His own eyes, in His own presence. That's when Daddy will rest. That's when our Heavenly Father will rest. When He sees us in His presence, in His kingdom. How can I be in God's presence? The only way to be in God's presence when I am sin free. Because sin is darkness, light is holiness. God is light, God is holy. Darkness cannot mix with light. Sin cannot mix with holiness. If I'm in a sinful status, I can't be in God's presence. And as long as I'm not in His presence, He cannot rest. Because a, a father, an earthly father, how can he be happy when one of his children are lost? Can he ever be happy? Never. The only time daddy will be happy when he sees his son coming back home in one piece. <coughs> then he'll say, finally I'm impressed. And he's going to get up from happiness, clean the whole house, make a big barbecue, and invite the whole neighborhood. He's sweating it out. He's working his guts off. But he's enjoying it because his son being back home means everything. Now I'm at rest, even now if I'm working hard. So when can I be in God's presence? On the seventh day. The resting day. And what is the rest of God when we are sin free? When did we become sin free? Saturday? No, Sunday. Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. The resurrection of Jesus Christ paid the price of our sins once and for all. And for the first time ever, Jesus says it to Mary Magdalene, Go and say to my brothers, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. For the first time ever, Jesus himself says, Brothers, he never said it before the cross. After the cross, after resurrection, he says, brother. And who is Jesus? The Son of God. And if the Son of God says to me, you're my brother, what does that make me? The Son of God. Before the cross, he couldn't say, brother, why? Because I was living in sin. I can't be the Son of God living in, sin of, in a sinful status. But after Jesus' resurrection, the price was paid. I'm sin free now by the blood of the Lamb and his resurrection. Now he can call me brother. And now I am the son. And when I'm the son, I'm in God's presence. And when I'm in his presence, I am entering the true Sabbath. God is at rest. He saw me back to his house once more by the resurrection of his son. So who is Sabbath? Jesus of Nazareth. And what is the spiritual Sabbath? Sunday, the eighth day. The world's time is seven. Can't go out of seven. This is our time. Number eight is not a earthly time. 
And even the number 8 in English is, is a symbol for infinity. You can't get out of the circle. <laughs> Two circles join together. You keep on going. You keep on going. It's a never ending story. Number 8 is eternity. It's a never, never ending day. Jesus brought me, came to bring me into the real seventh, the seventh hour. I came to heal you. I came to set you free. I came to pay the price of your sin and say to your son, he is made whole because I am the Sabbath and I came to bring you into the Sunday resurrection, the eighth day, which is the eternal day. The eighth is the other one. And that day is always going to be one day that has no end. The sun will never set because the sun of that day, S-U-N, is Jesus of heaven that will shine on you and enlighten you and illuminate you for eternities and eternities to come. Believe on the Word. Now we said the signs, the seven signs in the Gospel of John are the seven sacraments in the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, sec the seven sacraments are slightly different from our Church to other Apostolic Churches. But I can say to those who are from the Coptic Orthodox and some Catholics here, I can say that this sign is the is another sacrament of the seven which you can which it can fit. It can fit confession. The sacrament of confession and repentance. It's slightly different to our sacrament. I'm not gonna say it to you because I don't wanna I'll bother you with but no hard feelings it's still sacraments and they're all pre close but you can put this as the sacrament of confession we said that the, the wedding of Cana is the sacrament of baptism being born again by baptism not by faith by being baptized in water and spirit you are born again the holy baptism is born again Born again is not when you say, Jesus come into my life and make me a brand new human being. This is not born again. This is renewal of your relationship. Updating your relationship. And this renewal of relationship should happen every single second of your life. For the rest of your life. What is born again? Baptism. One of the seven sacraments. When you are baptized and when you believe on the word, Confess, confession, repent. Jesus, my son is sick. I'm sick. That means I'm sick spiritually. I'm a sinner. That's what sickness means. Jesus, I'm sick. I'm a sinner. When you come and confess, Jesus will say, Go, you are made whole. And if you believe on the word of Jesus Christ, what you confess is gone. Piece of advice. You'll go to a priest or some clergyman and you, you want to confess. And what's confession? Releasing the pressure. Too much pressure, man. Too much load on the girl's shoulders. I want to release it. So you go and release them, I've done this, I've stuffed up, I've met someone, I killed someone, I shot someone, I sold drugs to someone, I drank alcohol, I lied, I swore, I whatever. I told my dad off, I told my mom off, I stole from my dad's pocket money. Ah, you mean? So when you confess all your sins, and you mean it, you're going to start crying, if you really mean it. Right? And when that priest says, your sins are forgiven and that's going to be the other miracle of the world. Now this is confession. What is the result of the confession? So, when you go out, the very first thing is going to come to you is doubt. Satan will come and attack you. And you start putting doubts in your head to say, and who says your sins are forgiven? And who says Jesus said, no, who says that this priest is going to be able to do it with you? You can't do it. I know you better believe in the word. Not of the priest, but you better believe on the authority of the priesthood which Jesus gave to a certain people. You better believe on that authority. And he said to Simon Peter, whatever you bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loosen on earth shall be loosened in 
from heaven. This is the word of Jesus, the Almighty God. Not Simon, not Marmari, Jesus of heaven. And if you believe, your son is healed. Confession. Confessing my words. And when you believe on the word of Jesus, whatever you confess is cleansed. Thank you so much for your attention. May the Lord Jesus bless you. God's willing, we will continue with our seven, the seven miracles in the Gospel of St. John. Now, so far we've covered two. The next one is going to be the healing of the paralyzed man at Bethsaida for 38 years. He was paralyzed. Chapter 5 in the Gospel of St. John. Read the Gospel of St. John as we go along. Uh, the next miracle is chapter 5 healing this paralyzed man who was paralyzed for 38 years. That's another sign, another teaching of the Holy Bible, the true living and life-giving Word of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, love be thy name, and thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore.